Hello, Leiden. Hello, Leiden. Hello, Leiden. Hello, Leiden. Hello, Leiden. Hello, Leiden. Leiden. Hello, 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 Leiden. As you know, every show is about stories, stories of amazing international community members living in Leiden. So today we have two fantastic guests in our studio. We have Kenneth Mingo from Uganda and we have Jennifer Vargas from Colombia. Welcome to our studio. Before you go on with our conversation, why don't I ask you to introduce yourself? Um, Kenneth, would you like to do that? Who is Kenneth? Tell us a little bit about yourself. I was born and raised in Uganda. I'm a published author, I'm a speaker, and also a coach. And right now I'm helping other people with writing their books and telling their own stories. Yeah, I live in the Netherlands, in Leiden, specifically with my wife. What about you, Jennifer? Who's Jennifer? Well, thank you for having me. My name is Jennifer Vargas, originally from Colombia. Uh, when I was 10 years old, my parents moved to Aruba, which is part of the kingdom, the Dutch kingdom. I lived there for more or less 29 years, and I moved to the Netherlands, to Leiden, uh, almost a year ago. So as you know, we have um, a little tradition in our studio that we usually ask our guests to bring little objects that have emotional value for, uh, for you. Why don't we start from you, Kenneth? What did you bring us today? Um, so what I brought is a copy of my book, Opening Up, The Strength You Need to Persevere. It came out of journey that brought me eventually to Leiden. Mm. And basically, I looked back on my own experience and took the lessons out of what I went through and just told my story as it is. And so the name of the book is Opening Up. Thank you. That's beautiful, actually. Yeah. Very nice. Thanks. Thank you, Jennifer. What about you? What did you bring us today? Well, like I said, um, I moved from Aruba. To be honest, uh, when I was asked to bring something, I am not attached to anything. The only thing that I brought was literally my daughter, which I can leave behind. But for the rest, I, I, I sold everything I had and packed two bags and I came. So I'm honestly not a person who gets attached to things. But I did bring this little tree. It was a souvenir. Somebody gave it to me so that I didn't forget Aruba. And it's very funny because now I'm traveling with my tree everywhere and I take like a selfie with it. So it became like my, my traveling palm tree. Thank you for sharing with us. And as you know, we did um, make short profiles, um, a bit more close look to your lives. Um, we're going to have a look now, right? Yeah. So, Kenneth, let's start from you. Where did you take us? Hello. Hello, Kenneth. How hey. are you? Very good, thank you. Look you look very sharp. Planning to go somewhere? Um, I have to do some recordings le uh, uh, this afternoon, so I was just getting ready for that. Oh, great. Yeah. So it, it's good to see you today. Thank you. Uh, it's a bit warm in your house. Yes, please. It's, uh, the weather is wonderful today. It's uh, super excited about the sunny days coming in. And uh, So how you ended up in Leiden? Um, the brief story is I'm here for life. Oh, you followed your partner? <laughs> yes, re uh, recently. But um, the elaborate story is migration. Okay. I will tell you about that. You said love brought you to Leiden and then you came to Netherlands as a migrant. Yeah. How did love happen? Actually, we met in Leiden. So I... Uh, the long story is I came here uh, in 2009 and started a procedure that lasted two years. And after those two years, I was in an immigration detention center, locked up as a, an illegal migrant. And I joined a church. I was living in The Hague at the time. And the church had a branch in Leiden and I came to Leiden because of the church and one year later I met my wife in the church. How was your experience uh, living in the um, co-op facilities? It was waiting. There was a lot of waiting. It's, uh, it's like uh, life was put on hold 
or like I was basically just waiting for permission to do anything, go to school or get a job and it was just a lot of waiting. And uh, I can see two cities uh, on the wall. So one I can assume is your birthplace and the other seems like a Dutch name. Yes. Can you talk about that? What's that? So this, the, the one on my uh, left is Kampala, the, city, the capital city of Uganda where I was born and raised. And the other one is Katshove, which is uh, in the south of the Netherlands. And that's where my wife comes from. And we thought, yeah, this is, this is something that interested us because what we are doing is basically just bringing uh, a bit of who we are into this relationship and trying to make something new out of it. So we're going to have to put the map of Leiden somewhere, maybe in the middle of this, uh, because eventually we have come from two different places and we are building something in Leiden. And I can see a guitar behind you. Do you play guitar? Um, yes, I play a little bit. Uh, can you try? <laughs> no? Yeah. All right. It's a... Uh, I wasn't expecting that, but sometimes in our lives we all have pain, we all have sorrow. But if we are wise, we know that there's always tomorrow. Lean on me. You almost serenaded Tahir. What a beautiful <laughs> song. <laughs> Lovely. Um, yeah, it's it's one of those things. I I don't play that often, mm. but it's actually one of the things that I picked up out of my own journey. And I didn't have to. I didn't go to school or to take a course to learn how to play the guitar. I taught myself. Um, Jennifer, why don't we look at your video? <laughs> Where did you take us? Hello, Jennifer. Hello. How are you? Good, thank you. How are you? And uh, my first question, as always, how did you end up in Leiden? Well, that's a very interesting story, and I think it's due to the COVID. So. So Would you like to hear about it? Yeah, sure, sure. <laughs> well, um, before living here, I was living in Aruba. That's a small island that belongs to the Dutch Kingdom in the Caribbean. And when they locked down, uh, literally like 87% uh, of the people were sent home. So, because we live out of tourism. So then, after a couple of months of uh, this uh, situation, I decided to take measures and ended up here. Okay, let's go inside. When you arrived in Leiden, uh, what was your first impression of the city? Uh, well, to be honest, uh, it was very interesting because I've never been to Leiden. I only heard about Leiden University because of the students that come here. Um, but uh, I was contacted by a company when I applied uh, by, via LinkedIn. And I only came to Leiden for the interview. So it was uh, a shock and it was like love at first sight so i've been i was living in um, den haag for a couple of uh, months and then i moved here right in january but um, the vibe is completely different so i was like even if they don't hire me i'm going to just be living here i, I feel a connection to late and it's beautiful you're from colombia and talking about cliches <laughs> colombia is famous for two things one oh. is coffee and the other one is that series on Netflix. <laughs> okay, well, uh, that's surprising. I thought you were going to say other things. <laughs> yeah, well, Colombia... What are the other things I'm missing? Well, Colombia, you should know that uh, Colombia is also very well known about beautiful women. We have uh, most of the uh, world emeralds. You get them from Colombia. 
uh, we have uh, Gabriel Garcia Marquez. He got a Nobel Prize in 84. So there are really a lot of good things that you should know about Colombia instead of, of the narcos and those things that usually are so, I think... Uh, the popular culture. Yeah, you so, know, it's very sad that that gets so much attention when in truth is uh, we are it's such a be beautiful country. Yeah. I love to volunteer and that is part of like my system. So as soon I arrived to Leiden in January and just uh, last month, by the, the end of the month in May, there was this big event called Enel Dut. Um, it's a volunteer event where you call people, regular people, to just do something for the community, you know, to give back. So uh, I was living right uh, next door and I noticed this park is on the plan, so I just signed up. But I found out that they need more funding and they need more volunteers. So that's why I brought you here, you know, so that people can see that it's very nice when you get to enjoy it, but it's also nice when you get to actively participate in keeping it. Jennifer, a beautiful initiative that you have joined to be part of. Um, volunteering, is this something Colombian uh, that comes from the culture or that, that's something Jennifer likes doing? Since I was, I believe the first time I volunteered, I was 15 years old and I volunteered with an elderly house. Um, so, and then with uh, Horvanich. So to me, it's very important to volunteer. To me, it's like a calling. Whenever I see something that can be done, I, I am just there. What was your life like in Uganda before you came to the Netherlands? I had always these dreams of traveling the world. If there's something that I can look back to and see that stuck with me, it was this dream of traveling and exploring the world. And it all started when I was about like four years old. Mm. My dad left Uganda in 1989. He went to the States. What I understood from my mom is that he went on a plane. Uh, my mother had four children, me inclusive, but in comparison to her other three children, I gave her more trouble than all three of them combined. I stayed in school because my mom could not let me leave school. We fought about that, but and I'm forever grateful. When I was around 12, actually, I knew that it was not a matter of if it would happen, but rather when it would happen. It happened in 2009, I got an opportunity to leave Uganda. Beautiful story. I'm sure we're going to hear more about what happened after you left Uganda. <laughs> but for now, what about you, Jennifer? Um, so you left um, Colombia when you were only 10 years old. Was Aruba a different country for you as a child? 10-year-old, I mean, almost uh, a teenager, right? So how did it reflect on your growing up? Like, you were you a Colombian in Aruba or you became the Arubian this is a, a very personal experience. Uh, we speak the language. After so many years, you get the nationality. You are part of the community. But still, somehow, some people don't, don't actually accept you. Mm. You are always the Colombian. <laughs> so I remember children can be very cruel. Uh, the first time I heard words about being an immigrant or illegal and, and in a very despective mode, I, I would run home like, what does this mean? Because they call me such and, and but okay. When you grow like that, still you love the country. I personally, whenever they ask me, maybe I feel more connected to Aruba than to Colombia because I lived there like almost 30 years and Colombia, I left 20. I love Aruba so much, but unfortunately it was, um, I think, uh, due to the COVID many things surface, especially how people feel about you. So mm. when there is this fear of, uncertainty and and then some people become like okay there's not even enough for us it's time for the immigrants to leave uh -huh. you know that was actually something that was sort of triggering and very sad and hurtful that is a challenge um so you both had to leave um from places that you called home um kenneth migration um did you know how hard migration is in general or i wish i knew because Migration is as old as the human race. Mm. People have been migrating since time immemorial. And, but what I realize is uh, the people that migrate like I did don't like to talk about it. It's not that there were not people migrating like I did. They just don't want to talk about it. When it has happened, they just want to sort of like 
sweep it under the rug mm -hmm. and pretend like they were born where they live. My dad was living in the States since 1989, and it's only later that I understand because he did not come back to Uganda until 2007 for the first time, and simply because he was not yet uh, legally able to travel and return. Wow. So he was still in a procedure for migration. But we never talked about this. There was a brother of mine who was living here at the time, but he also never told me. And so my, in my mind, I was like, I get to the Netherlands, I get a job, I get application for university, I get a master's degree, and, and then I get here and they're like, no, it doesn't work like that because you're on a short stay visa and when it elapses, you have to leave or if you choose to stay, you have to get recognized as a, a legal resident because you're going to be illegal after your short stay visa elapses. And I was like, illegal? How can a human being be illegal on earth? They say, yeah, wake up. So there's two things. I wished I had been told this and I knew it. And the other side of the coin is, could it be true that someone tried to tell me but I didn't listen to it? Or you were just following the dream that you had since childhood that blinded your exactly. <laughs> sense of reality, right? No, the dream was alive yeah. and I realized for me that uh, this is something that I wanted to do for myself. Mm. Because actually the initial desire or the thing that sparked this dream was to go where my father was in the United States. And I read all about it in the book to go where my dad was. But when I applied for a visa to go to the States and it was denied, yeah. I was crushed. I, I just had never experienced rejection at that level. And I, I said, okay, if I can't go to the States, I'll go somewhere else. I thought and that I, somewhere else was Netherlands. I thought the next best thing is Europe. I'm sure that wasn't easy. <laughs> Um, Jennifer, um, you mentioned that when your parents left Colombia, that was their choice, not yours, right? Yep. And then you have left Aruba to come to the Netherlands and you have a young daughter, probably a similar age? Yeah, actually the same age. Yeah, the same age. <laughs> so, um, as a person who had been moved um, yes. through the family's past, through their, you know, um, reasoning, um, how did it make you feel, like, to make the move yourself? <clears throat> You know, to listening to his story is very interesting. And, and I recognize something very important that you mentioned. And you are still wondering, did somebody actually share with me and I didn't pay attention or whatever? Nobody said. Uh, no matter if you're legal, naturalized or have the nationality, so the Dutch passport, you are always Colombian. So and, and you suddenly, even if and these are the unspoken things, uh, you are a second class citizen, even though nobody's telling you. Yeah. The way they make you feel and the way things work out for you ah. is a second. And, and nobody wants to talk about it, you know. So my father, because of the violence and the situation in Colombia in late 80s, he decided to move to Aruba, which is uh, truly a blessing. But what did I do for myself? You know, I was there after 30 years. And, and the island is wonderful. It's beautiful and everything. But I believe you have um, a certain path until you grow. Mm. And then you need to continue to grow or you just stay in that comfort zone. So to be honest, my father passed three years ago. And after his passing, I felt that I didn't belong to the island anymore. For whatever oh. reason it is, I felt I, I, there's no home anymore. I, I wanted to leave, but I never had the impulse to actually do it until COVID happened. The difference is, like you said, I went through it. You develop a really tough skin. So you know about insults and offenses and you also know about good people around so it's better to be focused you know laser focused on the good than the bad so uh, that i try to teach my daughter that and so Definitely. when we move here um to be honest a lot of people actually that we come we, we swear like oh i think i moved to the Netherlands. i'm a single mother they were like are you crazy <laughs> you're a single mother who's gonna watch over your daughter so and then you know they discriminate the first thing we felt uh, with my siblings talking about this was 
people are so afraid, they are transferring their own limitations to you. Exactly. Of so I decided not to tell anybody. Yeah. So actually when we moved, <laughs> the, only the very close friends knew and the rest of the world didn't know. <laughs> Kenneth, as you know, we have uh, another um, tradition in our show. We have lots of traditions. Um, we ask our participants to bring a photo of their favorite Leitner. May I ask, who did you bring us? Um, Rembrandt von Rijn. Why Rembrandt? I've been greatly inspired by his life work. That we don't have his physical presence with us anymore. But the work that he dedicated his life to still inspires people. That's a true a testament that if we find the thing that we love to do and we focus on doing that, the work that we do will sure outlive us. And not just outlive us, but also inspire our generation and the generations to come. What a beautiful way of describing Rembrandt's work. Thank you. You're welcome. So what about you, Jennifer? Who did you bring us? Who's oh, your well. favorite Leitner? Well, uh, to be honest, uh, I... That, that was awesome, by the way. <laughs> um, I brought uh, the picture of my boss. Mm -hmm. His name is Joris Kastermans. Uh, actually, it's, it's all part of the journey. To, when I was uh, living in Aruba and I came to the Netherlands, I didn't have a job and I didn't have a house, to be honest. I just decided I'm leaving and let's see what happens. So the day I was boarding, um, I had a video call, video interview with him for his uh, company. He's developing an app for people who stutters. So he stutters himself. He's a mild stutter. So uh, this application is so awesome. And the things he's going through just to make it is, is really cool. So in, in my case, um, when I ask about, like when I ask him uh, why people who stutter, and he told me, yeah, the population who stutters in the world is around 1%. So it's not really a target market for anybody who oh. wants to profit, but he has it close to his heart and he wants to help people. He told me, um, sometimes you go to work and you have a hard day and you want to talk to your wife or you want to just let it out, but then you are frustrated and it adds to your stuttering. Mm -hmm. So the frustration grows. And, oh. and I never knew uh, it can be so hard for, for people who stutter. So. Uh, to me, I was moved. I think it's really awesome what he tries to do, even if it's just a few um, people that you're going to, well, 1% of the world is uh, still a, a good percentage. But I mean, uh, that you are so moved to do amazing things, I think is great. So Absolutely. Is the product ready? What are we no, making? Not no. Yet. Actually, I was hired to do the data collection. So we are con currently uh, gathering audio, really good quality, so that we can train the model, the AI. And hopefully by October, we will have like a pilot to present. Awesome. Sounds Fantastic. Really we're looking forward to test it. I'll let you know I about do it. I stutter sometimes too oh. when I'm nervous. <laughs> that happens. Um, one very important um, moment that I want to discuss with you, um, religion and the role of religion in your, in your lives. Um, Kenneth, you mentioned something um, absolutely fantastic that has inspired you to look very deep into yourself. There was a poster um, in the detention um, center that had set you in a path. Can you tell us a little bit about that path, please? Like how did it inspire you to seek God and to um, read Bible and look way deeper beyond yourself? So looking back on my own experience in Uganda, I was very troublesome. Mm. And it was the world's fault that my life was not okay. I blamed my mother, I blamed my father, I blamed the government, I blamed the system. And then I came to the Netherlands and I just transferred the blame to the IND, the immigration authorities, the police and everything. And it was never my fault. Then I'm picked up and put in the detention center after being two years in a migration procedure that... I shouldn't have even been in in the first place because I wasn't a refugee. But I'm taken to this detention center and one day I'm there and I see this poster that says, what would you think if I told you that everything that has happened in your life has had a part to play in you ending up here? Mm -hmm. And what would you say 
if I told you that right here, right now, is exactly where you're supposed to be in order for a future that you cannot even start to think about to come into play for you. And I reflected on all my life choices. I was looking for my answers outside of me. It was always someone else's fault. And now I was in detention, and it was not the government that was in prison. It was not my father, it was, it was not my mother, it was me. I was there, and I realized that I have to own it and acknowledge that I have brought myself to this place. And I realized I had to just forgive myself and also to forgive the past and whoever it is that I thought I was holding uh, something against. Because the beauty of forgiveness is this, that to forgive is to set the prisoner free, only to realize that the prisoner was you. Thank you for sharing. And kudos to the person who hanged that poster in a detention facility, but I really wish that immigration detention centers would be abolished soon, as soon as possible, so that people do not have to go through the same hardships that you have gone. Although, you know, you did make a journey out of uh, the hardships that you have faced, but um, it doesn't justify the need for detention centers for people who are running away something to seek safety and a proper lifestyle with all the basic needs met. Right? Indeed. I agree with you totally. Thank you. Jennifer, uh, what about you? What has been your journey like <laughs> with the religion? I was born and raised Catholic, and I developed many questions that were not answered by the priest. Unfortunately, uh, whenever you ask something out of the box, and in my case, I ask something that I ask for more information. Mm. And then he's like, no, but you have everything you need in the Bible. And I'm like, yeah, but to me... There's more. There's missing something. So, and and I think the way I was approached, it was like uh, with fear. Mm. Oh no, no! If you seek anything else, you're becoming a heretic, and you're gonna burn in hell. When I received that information like that, I was like, oh, so I'm being honest, and I'm following my heart, and I'm gonna burn in hell. Yeah. <laughs> then I deserve it, right? But I'm being honest. And that day, at 17 years old, I literally moved away from Catholicism and I became spiritual. But I didn't have or hold this loyalty, which is imposed. So yeah. you are loyal because your family is and everybody is, but do you really feel it? Do you re you, are you sincere? So in my case, I was free from that imposed loyalty. And I love theology. I've been reading about everything. And um, my journey took me seven years ago to actually to Islam. So I am a reverted Muslim and I practice. And in Aruba there was back then um, not not even a masjid. You mm. have no halal food. So at, at first I thought, okay, it, it was a very interesting uh, path. So I realized it's not about you and your community. Actually everything is and will always be between you and your creator. Um, I think it's very important to be respectful. And that is one of the things that maybe, unfortunately, a lot of people have lost or maybe don't practice in Islam, unfortunately. Because everything is between you and your creator. And if you are to tell somebody how to improve their life, you better say it in a very sweet way. If we were to just practice how beautiful it is that you're supposed to speak, we wouldn't have such a bad image because unfortunately it's a bad image not because of the deen or the religion itself yeah. but because of the way we are practicing it. Absolutely. So, and whatever the means, whatever the journey answers your question yeah. the best or feeds your heart, you should definitely embark on that journey yeah. and hold it dear to your heart. There is no judgment in who believes in what, right? Exactly. We're here to join each other in the journey going back home. So that's about exactly. it. Exactly. <laughs> Absolutely. Thank you. Uh, what a beautiful conversation we had today. Um, it was a blessing to get to know both of you. <laughs> Just a bit, little bit more. I wish we had more time to uh, um, discuss everything in detail. But, folks, this is the end of another um, Saturday show. Um, please watch us, like us, share us. We are almost everywhere in all the social media accounts, YouTube, Facebook, Instagram, you name it. And if you are a foreigner and you have a story just like Jennifer and Kenneth did today, please email us at hellolyden at slotostad.nl.
That's it. Have a good evening. That was Sam Abasanova for Slotestad TV. Hello, Leiden. Leho, Leiden. Khush amadid, Leiden. Zdrasui, Leiden. Hello, Leiden. Bonjour, Leiden. Hello, Leiden. Marhaba, Leiden. Ciao, Leiden. Hi, Podai, Leiden.